Welcome to the You Love to See It podcast, coverage of your Seattle Mariners. Hello and welcome once again to the You Love to See It podcast, coverage of your Seattle Mariners. I am your host, Jake. You can find me on Twitter at Mariners Jerseys, and you can find all episodes of this podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a like and subscribe. I'd appreciate it. You can comment down below. Uh, any guests you want to see next, any questions you have for the next episode, anything like that. And if you're listening on streaming platforms, leave the five-star review and follow the show. I'd appreciate it, and it helps a lot. Uh, today's guest is Jay from Jay's Trident Podcast, which currently sits at 2.6K subs on YouTube. And Jay is known for his uh, stream of consciousness type videos. That's what I like to call it, where he can just sit down and talk about anything Mariners and Seahawks related and still makes it entertaining and informative. Uh, so, yeah, welcome to the show, Jay. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jake. I appreciate it. I, I love that stream of consciousness. I'm going to remember that because people ask yeah. me what my channel is. So that is a great way to put it. So, no, yeah. really appreciate you having me. Excited to talk Mariners. Yeah, no, we'll we'll get right into it. And I guess to uh, I always start with this, uh, getting to know your background as a Mariners fan, kind of what, what started it all for you when it comes to the Seattle Mariners or baseball in general. What, what came first? Yeah. Um, Honestly, so it's cliche, but 95, you know, I was growing up in Washington. Um, baseball was all, never my first sport as a kid. It was always football. Football is just a little more action packed. I think baseball, it's a little slower. You kind of got to appreciate the ambiance a little bit of baseball. And I was never really into it, but 95 sucked me in. All my buddies, all my friends, if we were in third or fourth grade at the time were, you know, hyped up for it. So I kind of hopped on the bandwagon. I was nine, 10. So I think it's forgivable, but, um, that really sucked me into baseball. And then, um, yeah, just from there it's cliche, but 95 was really what brought me in. And it wasn't until, um, the one game playoff with the angels. I just didn't watch a lot of baseball. Everyone was talking about it. I didn't even know what it meant to have a one game playoff at the time, but, uh, they let us home from school early or we were watching it in school and it just, Got me hooked. The energy of it all, the you know, the Soho inside the park grand slam, if you want to call it that, it just it got me hooked. So you would probably say that was one of your favorite moments growing up as a Mariners fan too. It was kind of that inaugural uh, becoming a fan moment of in '95. Or would you say there's anything else that kind of trumps yeah, it for you? Um, I think that's what got me just like into baseball in general. You know, when you're a kid, you kind of, you got your whole life. So I was never like I am now where it's like every inning I'm biting my nails, you yeah, know, waiting course. for like, you know, pitchers in a jam, you know, when you're a kid, you're just like, oh, this is fun to watch and I want to go to the game. So, you know, we went to a few games in 96. We were actually, we had season tickets to the Seahawks. I wanted to go watch some baseball games. So we went in 96 for a couple of times. Um, you know, then we actually moved. I moved to Boston on the East Coast, mm. got to go to Fenway Park a couple times, really just fell in love with sort of the, the atmosphere of baseball, just, you know, sitting at Fenway Park. The fact that in baseball, you know, the stadium dimensions matter. No other sport has that. You know, football, yeah. it's, it, you know, it's all 100 yards, no matter what. Baseball, it's just, it, it's kind of a different feel. And then, you know, and then hearing the voice of Dave Niehaus would be the other thing, you know, as a kid in the summer, it was just part of my childhood to hear Dave. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. And I, I, when it comes to Fenway too, it's always been on my bucket list. And uh, one of my friends did like a, a stadium tour a couple years ago. Uh, he went on a trip to Boston and, uh, I was, I was pretty much just like living vicariously through him. Cause I'm like, I'm just, you know, been such a baseball fan for my entire life. And so to like go into a place like that with the history it's had be like Babe Ruth played in this park, right? Like how insane is it to like be just standing in a place where Babe Ruth, Ted Williams, all those greats played just to be like, you know, however many years ago I could I'm 30 feet away from them you know if you wanted to to time shift in your mind a little bit um but yeah I and I as far as growing up for me similar to you like that first moment for me was uh my my dad was a as a Giants fan his whole life so I would say the first one I really remember was uh when Barry Bonds hit the record-breaking home run 
and um, I watched it with him, and I remember watching him cry. I've never seen him cry at sports before. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was the first thing that graded me like, wow, that like this really matters to people. Uh, that's pretty pretty cool. But um, yeah, so it, did you have any specific player like growing up that was your favorite, whether it was Mariners or I mean, even I guess in baseball at all, like in, in the entire sphere, doesn't even have to be a Mariners player. Yeah. And I love that story about your dad. Cause it truly is, you know, just to go back a little bit, I, you know, I don't know, you know, I know for my dad, you know, he grew up in LA, he was a Dodgers fan and Koufax and Drysdale mm -hmm. and all those guys. So it, it really does. It becomes part of your life and may, maybe it shouldn't, I don't know, but yeah. I love it. There is nothing that brings people together like sports. So, uh, you know, I think that's a great little story. And, um, for me, it was always uh, Edgar was my guy growing up. Um, okay. You know, obviously I love Junior and everything, but Junior was always, I always use the word like unattainable. Like he was top prospect. He was, you know, he was kind of so far above everything else in my mind that I could never be Junior. But Edgar was a little bit more, you know, came up in the minors, long minor league career, and then just found his niche as a DH. I always liked the, um want to be different. So everybody imitated junior i always liked edgar and uh oddly enough mike blowers was one of my favorite that's why i love nice. blowers on the uh, tv broadcast i don't know why i just always gravitated towards kind of the secondary players um not that edgar was secondary to on end to, of course for yeah. anything but i know um, what you mean though yeah Ed, yeah yeah Ed, edgar was my guy but truthfully as a kid i i loved all of them i loved joey cora i loved randy johnson I, you know there wasn't a guy I, I didn't like on that team when I was younger. Is there anyone on the current club that you would kind of liken to that Edgar type role as someone who, cause I, I would say like the only person close to Griffey would be, I guess, Julio now. Cause he just had that lightning speed ascension in the minors and, you know, in his rookie year, he gets this huge extension for until he's in his thirties. So who, who would you say like is kind of that player for you right now? It's got to be big dumper. Um, yeah. You know, it's just his profile, his, his mannerisms, the way he carries himself, that clutchness that he seems to have mm -hmm. for the big moments. Um, and I think that's a great analogy. Julio kind of is Griffey, you know, to me, like just that superstar. He can do it all. Um, but it's got to be Cal. I, I think Cal's probably my favorite player uh, on the team right now. And just just his leadership, too, that you've seen on this team, you know, whether it's behind the plate or even him willing to kind of call out, you know, uh, ownership in front office a little bit. Not to the point where he's, you know, making personal attacks, but you can just see he wants to win so bad. And I think they all do. I'm not saying anybody else on the team doesn't, but, um, yep. uh, you know, Cal would be the guy for me today. Yeah, no, I agree a lot. And I also there's a bit of that underrated aspect where it feels like he's still not talked about as like one of the best catchers in the game, even though he Agreed. literally is like probably top three right now. Um, right. But, so, right. yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. Um, so getting into like the content and whatnot on June 16th, 2022 is when you posted your first video of the Jay's Trident podcast YouTube channel. Uh, so what made you start to make content? What What's triggered all that to happen? So uh, I got to give my wife the nod on that one. Um, after every game, Seahawks or Mariners, I like to go on these rants about what they could have done differently or, or mm -hmm. talking about, boy, that that pitch that Castillo threw in the third inning, that was the key because they got out of that jam. And, and my wife loves sports. She's a big sports fan, but she's also kind of like, Oh, okay, honey, like that, that's great. Yeah. She's like, why don't you start a, start, start, start a YouTube channel and talk to Mariners fans that want to listen to 50 minutes of a post-game recap? So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I've thought about doing it. And, you know, I just, in my first video, I think was in a, in our bedroom closet. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> there's all the it. stuff hanging in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, you know, I turned on my phone. It was on my cell phone. No mic, nothing. And, you know, decide to make a video and, and the first few, um, I actually got out of it actually a little bit in 2022. I did post game recaps, stop. My job was just getting crazy. Couldn't really do it. Then came back during the playoffs after the Robbie Ray game and just kind of, you know, took off a bit from there and, you know, and then last year really gained some traction with the post game recaps and, um, you know, went from there, but yeah, my wife would be the inspiration for 
or the channel and just the fact that I can talk sports for hours and, you know, drive my family nuts. So instead, <laughs> I just come in front of a computer, look a little webcam and the webcam can't tell me to shut up. So, <laughs> yeah. No, do, you, do you feel like it's kind of uh, been uh, almost like a therapeutic kind of feeling for you to be able to do that after every game and, and especially to, to get the traction you've had? Like I said, you're at, you know, over two and a half K subs and whatnot. So, you know, that's two and a half thousand people who have been like i want to hear this guy after every game you know tell me what's going on and and how he felt about you know what happens like has that felt pretty cool for you yeah i, I would actually say therapeutic because actually it's funny enough that's the word i use it, it it's yeah you know, in fact i'll even call it after tough games i'll even call it a therapy session a little bit you know if they have a devastating loss um, it's, it's really great for me. It helps me get it out there. Whether people agree or disagree with my takes, it just, you, you know, when you lose brutal, especially after brutal losses or even celebrating a win, it just, sometimes you just need to talk it through and, and yeah. get, and that helps. And then, yeah, I'm blown away that that many people actually, you know, care what I have to say about it. I I've always equated it to, like I said, a, a therapy session is a great way to put it. And my channel's very much like, hey, you know, we're grabbing a beer, soda, if you don't drink, whatever it may be. And we're just sitting there and we're just talking. It would be the same if we were, you know, at a bar watching the game and talking about it. I Sometimes mid-video, I'll change an opinion and go, well, actually, maybe that wasn't so bad because I'm just talking it through. It's not like a set, you know, in fact, the post-game recaps, I, I try to take little notes just to remember certain things in the game that happened. Yeah. But for the most part, it's just turn on the camera and, and start talking about it. So that's really what my channels I, I meant for it to be. Just people that can come in, we're having a beer or something, and, and we're just talking Mariners. The opinions might be all over the place because sports is emotional. That's of that's course. what happens. Is there any specific uh, like devastating loss that you felt like was the, the most uh, needed of the therapy sessions last year? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think back. There was a couple rough ones. Um, you know, I think Munoz blew that save against the White Sox, but the team was on such a roll and they won that series that it didn't, that one didn't bother me too much. I, I don't know if there was actually... Um, the Reds game, they lost a game to the Reds. The mm -hmm. second game in the series were like Nick, Nick Martini hit a home run. <laughs> that was a tough one because they were skidding a little bit. Really. I think it was, it was tough in September because they were just, they just could not buy a win after August, yeah. which was so magical. I mean that they couldn't, they were just, no matter what they were winning games. August was so much fun. And then it was hard in September. The Dodgers series was rough. They went to Texas and got swept. So I don't know if there was one game for me that was like, ooh, but just having to do it after each game. I, it wasn't tough because I love my subs um, and, and, and enjoy coming on and talking about it. But it, it was kind of like, you know, same thing as yesterday. Not much more to say about it. So um, I don't know if there was really a loss. Was I'm trying to think that just stuck out as brutal there was that cubs game in april but you know in april you kind of throw some of those games out a little bit that i think might have been the most brutal loss they had in 2023 just because they were up like eight or nine nothing and they should have cruised to a victory and they blew it but in april you know you can kind of go okay well there's 140 games left there was a game in cleveland that matt brash blew the save um i think but they were going for a sweep so sometimes with those games i don't get as up at arms because i always look at like hey if you can win every series you're going to be a very good team. And baseball is going to have devastating losses. You know, there's 162. You are going to have a game that just rips you apart. Um, you just hope that you have a couple games that are just as, as magical on the other end. But um, I think just in general, the toughest ones were September. Just that, that Dodger series, the Rangers series in Texas. It, it was just the same stuff each night and they just couldn't buy a win. And it was just frustrating. Yeah, and I, I would say that September was definitely the worst for me, and I, I got to witness a bit of that August magic because I, I watched one of their games in August, or I went to one. I went to that like seven home run game at T-Mobile Park, so it's like I, I thought I was watching us cruise to the World Series. Potentially, I was just, like super right, high on right. it, and then uh, you know they had to buy those track suits to go to Met the Mets, and uh, 
you know <laughs> i really hope they discarded those with uh yep. hopefully flammable liquid is what i'm hoping um but so in about a year and a half you've posted 560 videos and so although it's been a short time from the beginning what 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 things would you say you've learned along your youtube journey thus far um, you know, I think for me, it's be yourself, you know, I, I and that's a kind of a cliche, cheesy thing to say, but d don't try to be something you're not St stick with your guts. If you're wrong, you're wrong. And if you don't know, you don't know. Um, I had some people ask me, you know, Hey, how can we do a draft recap for the, for the Mariners? I don't follow that enough to know. I mean, all I would be doing is taking other people's work and just repeating it. So, um, Christopher Crawford from my OY, he did a draft recap. I told people, just go watch his video. He broke it down. He knows those players better than me. Um, so I just try to be very honest. There are some things I, I don't know, so I'm willing to admit that. Um, I, I think that goes a long way with people. You know, you get a lot of people that make videos and I think, not phony, but they try and be like they have all the answers to everything. And if you don't, you don't. Um, I've also learned that people... At the end of the day, like, you know, I, sometimes I've done some fancy bells and whistles and, and I probably should do more. Nope. People, second. you know, click here, on my video here. Sorry, yep. it, it cut out again. So I didn't stop the recording, but just you can rewind yeah. to um, like basically at the end of uh, that. We don't have all the answers. Here, let's see. Still being a little shaky. I My, we will yeah. get through this. We will get through this. I know, I you're good. <laughs> I know we will. Um, <laughs> I'll let's see. I'll wait till it's a little bit clearer here. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's it's more fluid now, so we're good. Okay. I'll make sure to let so, you yeah, know. Yeah, you know. Cuts um, out. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So yeah, you know, it's um, you know, I I don't have all the answers to things, and I'm willing to admit that. There are things that I tell people I don't know. I probably could have more bells and whistles on my videos. And I think I will try and do that this year. Just, you know, more exciting thumbnails to get people to click is not a bad thing. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it, it's the person making the videos. You know, it, it, you can have all the bells and whistles you want. But if you're not providing good content for people, they're, they're not going to care. You know, I've seen plenty of people that do great thumbnails and stuff and they get 15 views or 10 views and that's okay if they're you know you're starting your journey on youtube you're not going to get a lot of views right off the bat but it, it's more about what you have to say and people just want people want real i think people want you know i think that's why i have the the subscribers i do i think they just enjoy that it's just me coming on and giving my thoughts on it and, and you know maybe giving a little voice to the fan base yeah, I think it's really important for people to be aware that every content creator you're watching right now, at the end of the day, like we're not professional analysts. We haven't played Major League Baseball. We are ultimately just fans who want to put out um, content because we enjoy it. And that goes for really any of them, even like the Locked On Mariners guys, right? Like at the end of the day, they are fans. They've been fans for a long time. They are knowledgeable still. I'm not, I'm not saying that we, you know, know nothing, but at the same time, like we have to be reasonable about what we know <laughs> and uh, it, kind of the same thing that you said, right? Like I have to be very clear that I'm only been a Mariner fan for a couple of years. So like, I'm still learning a lot about the team, the organization. I can't say I know you know, a bunch about the history necessarily. So I, and I'm not going to claim that I do, um, but I can do a, an okay job. I think about talking about the present and a, a, at least to the best I can. And it's still, it's just being true to like what you do know and don't act like, Oh, because I read baseball savant pages that I'm some genius uh, that knows everything about a player. I'm just going to give you my opinion. Ultimately, that's all these are. So, and, and you know, if you agree with it, great. If you disagree with it, that's fine too. Uh, you know, we can stay civil about it. So, um, exactly that. That's my thing too. I get. I've had a couple people that got. You know, I, for the most part, my commenters are great. My subscribers, but every now and then you get a couple people that are hostile. I'm like, listen, that's fine. You don't have to agree. And like you said, at the end of the day, we are all Mariners fans. We all want this team to win. We yeah. all want this team to have a World Series trophy. And I, I have respect for every every content creator. You know, in general, as long as they're 
you know, there's I for at least say for sports for Mariners because it takes guts to turn on the camera. It's not easy to put yourself out there. I'm not trying to like toot my own horn with that or anything, but for anybody, it is not needing to do. So I, I am, you know, even if I have, even if there's a Mariners content creator that, you know, would uh, disagree with everything I have to say, I, I have a ton of respect for anybody that is willing to come on. And as long as they're not being, you know, personal attacks on other people, I have the utmost respect for anybody coming on here and doing something. Cause it, it's not easy. It is not of easy course. to put yourself out there. Um, yeah. yeah. Agreed. Um, so yeah, I mean, every guest that I've had on so far has exhibited some sort of trait that I admire within their content for you, the way you can just sit down and talk out your thoughts, as I said earlier, without any stutters or jumbled sentences, which is something I'm super self-conscious about um, with my like speaking ability when it comes to unedited long form content. Cause of course, when I edit it, I can edit all that out and you'll never even know <laughs> it'll look great. Um, so I, I guess I'm curious, like has, uh, public speaking, I, I guess, if you want to call it that, like always been an easy thing for you or uh, how, how did you feel like you got that skill? Yeah. The, um, it's never been something that I, I've been afraid of. Um, I, I've done it before. I, I was on student councils when I was younger and would speak in front of a lot of people. Something when I was younger. I was in high school. And I forgot. I was giving. I was up in front giving a presentation, and I don't know if it was a teacher or someone that told me. And she said, "Are you nervous?" I, I am a little bit. She goes, "Trust me. Ninety percent of the people in here are going to fall asleep anyways and not listen regardless. So mm -hmm. it doesn't even matter what you have to say sometimes." And that's kind of how I take it. I just take it in stride, um, you know. And, and I've done things. I, I did a video where I kind of said to uh, avoid Jorge Soler. I didn't really like the profile. Now, as I went along, I kind of came to the conclusion the Mariners need a DH. And if that's Soler, then, then fine. But there's just, I thought some red flags. Oh, well, during my video, I pulled up his Savant page and I was actually like, Oh, it's actually a little better than I thought it was going to look. And a couple people were commenting like, well, why would you say to avoid signing him and not do the research on it? And my point was more like, I, you know, I'm sitting down, we're having a beer talking about it. It's like me and you were sitting there going, well, let's pull up his Savant page together. And we go, oh, that's actually a little better than I thought it was. So yeah. it, it's not so much, it goes back to like, I don't know everything. Some of this I'm just doing on the fly. And it was just more of a, you know, I, I think there is some valid reasons to this maybe. So it, it's just something that I, I've never really been, it, what I wanted my channel to be is just very natural, very how I would react post game. Everything I would all the stuff I would spew to my wife just comes in here on the camera now, essentially. Yeah. So that's really the goal of it. And if I mess up, you know, I, I, I mess up. So I, I just kind of let it happen. And that's, you know, like you said, what we're fans, I, we certainly have knowledge, right? We follow this team more than probably, you know, a lot of people that just watch casually do, but I do not have all the answers for what would make this team great or what would, mm -hmm. You know, get him ahead. I'm not paid to do that either. That's Jerry and Justin and Scott's job. Yeah. So I'll let them handle that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wish I was paid to do that, but I'm not. So, <laughs> you know, <Same. laughs> yeah. Uh, so as of today, we are 29 days away from spring training or the first game of spring training. Uh, so less than a month, finally, until we can hear the crack of the bat again and start watching some Mariners baseball uh, as long as root sports shows. And I know that was a bit of an issue last spring training. Um, but with that <laughs> said, we are less, less than a month and away. Uh, from this offseason being over so if i were to sum up the offseason moves and just to go over it briefly uh, notable players we subtracted so far a eugenio suarez jared kelenic robbie ray marco gonzalez tom murphy and isaiah campbell and notable additions mitch garver mitch hanniger luke rayley anthony de sclafani luis urias uh, sebi savala if you want to call him notable and carlos vargas um so as of right now uh, there could still be moves in the next 29 days. So that's still pos possible. Would you, what would you grade the Mariners off season so far and why? Great question. Um, if we're counting in optics with some of Jerry's comments, I'll say C minus just because I, and listen, I, everything Jerry said in that press conference, the 54% thing, I actually don't have a problem with that being their philosophy. It actually does make sense with what he was talking about, having a consistent winner. If, if you get to that number, some years you're going to be above and you can have a team that can win a World Series. I just don't, I think that's something that should be behind closed doors. 
I don't think that was great optics to the fan base to come out and say that. If we're just judging the moves themselves and then everything with ownership as well this offseason. So optics wise with everything, I'll say C minus with just the moves in general. I'm torn between C plus B minus. I, I, I don't really want to give them a B yet because I still think there's some room um, to do things. I, I did not like the. I have no problem salary dumping Marco and Evan White. That's fine. Get those contracts off the book. I'm not even the biggest Jared Kelenic fan in the world, to be perfectly honest. I think he's had three years. And truthfully, even last year, take away the April, he was kind of what he was prior. But I hate that he was had to be thrown into a salary dump. I think you could have used him or gotten better back in a deal for that. I don't mind trading a Eugenio Suarez. He's expensive and showed some signs of decline last year. But you don't really have like a, you know, like 2011 with Kyle Seeger knocking on the door to come right up and fill in the gap. So you salary dump Gino, you don't really have. I know, I know they got Urias now and, and that might be an adequate replacement. I prefer Urias more to be platooning with Rojas um, if, you know, I think that would be ideal. Um, but I do like some of the moves. Like I like Isaiah Campbell for Luis Urias. I think Urias is a decent bounce back candidate. Really good hitter in 21-22. Had a lot of injuries in 23 I like the Mitch Garver signing. You, you know, you get somebody you can just plug in at DH. You don't have to worry about Tommy LaStella and Cooper Humble having DH at bats. Yeah. And you don't have to trade anybody to get them. It's a signing. Uh, Mitch Hanniger has some risk. I love Mitch Hanniger, one of my favorite Mariners of the modern era. There's some risk. He didn't play a lot last year, was hurt. Even in 22, the numbers were okay, but he missed a lot of time. Um, so there's a risk there. But I like it. You, Robbie Ray, you probably weren't going to get anything out of this year, and you needed that right-handed outfield bat. And I love the Caballero for Luke Rayleigh deal. I think that's a fantastic move, um, and I'm a big fan of Luke Rayleigh. I think that's um, a really solid move. So I think overall they they've been okay. And there's outside of the Dodgers, most teams have been quiet this off season. So I think if I'm grading on a scale of the rest of the league, I'd actually give them a B. Um, but I think C plus. I think a C plus is kind of fair, you know, when you factor everything in with this ownership group and the budget and, and all the debacles there, and then some of the salary dumps and, and stuff like that. I, I'll say C plus. Yeah, I'm close. I would give it a C personally, uh, only because I, I do feel the roster is only marginally better than last year's. Um, the, the first two major trades, the Suarez and Kellenic trade, I think, Although they were salary dumps, so I get that you couldn't get like major leaguers back for those guys. I think we could have gotten better prospects personally, at least to, to really just soften the blow of that. I think if we were able to get, uh, I, I'm not even saying necessarily top 10, but at least like a top 20s here and there. Like I feel I would I think we would have felt a little bit better about it. Granted, at the end of the day, like salary dumping sucks and no one wants to, uh, to see that. Um, certainly wouldn't prefer it. I would prefer the ownership just, you know, gets their, their checkbooks right. out. <laughs> um, but if that's what we have yeah, to do, same, like, same. yeah. So, I mean, if we have to do that, like, I mean, I don't blame them for making those trades. I just, I am, uh, at least with the Kellenic trade specifically, very underwhelmed by what we got back from that. Um, and, and especially since the Braves pretty much just flipped white and Gonzalez anyways. So it's like, it really, right. I feel like we could have gotten more probably. Um, I, I will say though, the floor is definitely raised a bit. Um, so I will give some, you know, props for that. And, um, but at the end of the day, like I'm optimistic for the team in general. So I don't want this to come off like, oh, this team's going to suck or anything like that. I mean, I think I've made it pretty clear that I do think we can be a contender. But with that said, with the moves that we've done, a lot needs to go right, especially injuries for this team to truly contend for a division title, let alone a wild card spot. Um, just because that wild card spot, I mean, we have to remember how heavily contested it was we're talking upper 80s of wins to get in that wild card spot compared to the national league where it was like mid to low 80s like it's going to be tough and uh like i said a lot needs to go right i think garver needs to play a lot uh you know we, we can't have him knocked out after 60 games we have to hope he plays 120 ish hopefully um and then with hanniger it's really up to his injuries and if he can stay healthy and, you know, I, I do think he could produce. Obviously, he's going to feel comfortable in T-Mobile Park. 
duh. So not worried about that at all. Um, so th that that's kind of where I'm at. I would say C. So we're we're pretty close in our rankings. Um, so. And I guess looking forward to the 2024 season, uh, just a couple predictions I'm looking for. So there's three. Uh, where will the team end the season in the standings, which can be either division or wild card? Uh, breakout player, and who do you think is going to be the disappointing player of the year? Ooh, and I love your points about the offseason as well, about raising the floor. And there is a lot of risk. Like everybody they signed or traded for, I guess you could make a point every signing is at risk, but I, I think you're a hundred percent spot on um, with your assessment of it. So I think we're pretty close there uh, on our agreement. Um, you know, I, I try to be the eternal optimist. I'm going to say we get a breakout year. I, I'll say, I'm going to say 90 wins. And you know nice. what? I'll say they win the division. Well, you know what? Like, Let's go. <laughs> I, I, I'm with you. I love, I do love, I love the core of this team. I'm going to say Hanniger bounces back. Ty France has a bounce back year. Um, the pitching is elite. I think the bullpen finds its form a little bit after, you know, trading Seawald. They struggled. Eh, they were fine, but they struggled a little bit. Um, I think Urias bounces back from his season. I, I think Luke Rayleigh turns out to be a solid addition. And I think you might have the, I think Julio, I predicted him to win the MVP last year with Otani out of the AL. I think Julio wins the AL MVP. And then what nice. the other one was disappointment, right? So you got the standings. And so you said your breakout player, is there any specific one? Or are you just going to go with like the, the amalgamation of France and Hanniger and Julio? Yeah. Let me, th you know, I, I could see Dom Canzone actually breaking out, not in terms of like superstar breakout, but I think he's going to be a very solid player. Um, okay. If they platoon him, I think he's going to hit righties very well and be a, a, a very nice player. I mean, like Julio would kind of be my, because I think I'm going to predict him to win the MVP, but Julio is good anyways, that that's yeah. kind of not really a breakout necessarily. Yeah. And then for disappointment, um, uh, I, I am a little worried. I, I love that Bryce Miller's working on that splitter. Um, and I know Savant isn't everything, but you look at his page last year, there is some concerns there. Very fastball heavy. I thought he struggled a bit. I don't know if teams figured him out or if it was just some fatigue down the stretch a little bit. And that fastball is elite. And if that splitter he's working on is legit, then you know, you could probably throw this this comment out the window. But if it doesn't work, I, I am a little bit worried. Um, I, I hate saying disappointment because I really like Bryce Miller. I'm not, yeah. I don't, I, I, you know what I mean? I don't want to say like, oh, I think he's going to disappoint, but I, I do have some, um, nerves about, uh, uh, him holding up over the course of the season. Yeah, no, I, I, that makes plenty of sense. I, I, I do think, uh, we can kind of, we have to be a little bit reserved for both Miller or Wu. I, 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 although they're both great pitchers and I do think, um, they will turn out to be pretty, uh, you know, uh, high ceiling guys at least this year. And it sounds like they're planning on making them both full-time, uh, starters. So not going to be innings limits or anything like that. So, that worries me a little bit. I would say at least when it comes to like Wu, um, I guess a bit Miller, but he showed, I felt like a little bit more stamina than Wu does. So the fact that neither of them are going to have inning limits, um, granted, it's not going to matter for the first part of the, the season. But once we start getting into like after All-Star break, that's when I'm going to, we're, we're really going to have to keep an eye on those too, to, to see how they're doing fatigue wise. Um, I, I guess if I were to answer the questions I gave, I think they're still going to end up in second in the division. Personally, I think it's still Texas is to lose. Honestly, um, granted, I do think Texas had a lot going for them last year and a lot of guys having career years so that they are going to come back down to earth a bit. However, I still think they're probably going to get Montgomery back. And, um, I don't know if it's DeGrom and Scherzer are both out for like how long they're out for. I don't know if they're out for all of next season or only parts of it, but, um, you know, regardless, whenever those guys do come back, even though they're injury riddled, it's still going to be a problem. Uh, it's going to make them tougher to beat. So, um, but I do think we will end up getting the wild card spot. I am pretty confident that they're going to be in the high eighties at least. So, um, that that's where I'm at and kind of where my expectations rise And it. You know, if they end up winning the division, then awesome. We'll be popping champagne. It'll be great. Um, right. Yeah. 
Exactly. And, and, you know, I, I have no, like, I, you know, I'll say they win the division. This goes back to like, Hey, difference of opinion. Like, yeah, I could absolutely see Texas. I could still see Houston winning this division. Mm -hmm. Um, and your point about Texas too, I think at one point last year, I remember we were playing them and they were OPSing like 1000 with runners in scoring position. This was in June, something like that's just not sustainable. Um, one thing with Texas, so they could, while they might falter there, they were also really bad in one run games and so are the Mariners. The Mariners were under 500. So I'm hoping for a bit of a bounce back there yep. um, in the one run games. I don't expect them to be like the 44 and 10 they were two years ago. But even last year, I think they finished like 18 and 20 in one run games. If they'd been 22 and 16, which is, you know, decent, you know, they win the division easily. So hopefully a little bounce back there yeah. um, as well. Yeah. For me, I think the breakout player uh, is I'm choosing Luke Grayley. I think, you know, he's a lefty okay. pull about power bat. Um, so that works. Obviously, already we know well in T-Mobile Park. He's a decent defender and he's got good speed. So I feel like I can already just envision those right center gap extra base hits just pouring in. Um, I, I, I foresee a lot of doubles and potentially triples with, with him this year. So um, I, I think he's going to be a really good piece for us. And then... Uh, Hopefully this doesn't get me like canceled, but I said disappointing players, maybe going to be Mitch Hanniger. That's going to be a very uh, divisive one. Um, But I also think a lot of people see, could see why I say that at the end of the day, it's an injury thing. Granted that he's going to be great in the clubhouse. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about his chemistry with the team. I'm just worried about his injuries and how they will affect his production, whether he's on the field or off the field. So th- that's really where I'm at with him. Um, I would say he has, for me, the least expectations going into this year out of all the players. Like, I personally expect, like, France to come back. I expect Urias to be decent. I expect Rojas to be decent. Um, so I'm leaving my mind open for Hanniger, and I'm not necessarily going to be disappointed if he has kind of a bit of a rougher year. Um, so that, that's kind of where I'm at with with that, but I feel horrible saying that because I know Hanny is like no, no. super big fan favorite. <laughs> so you know, and here's the thing: you're not rooting against him. You know no, what I mean? It's I just that's to a totally good. fair prediction. Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm like I felt the same way saying Bryce Miller. Like I love Bryce Miller. Nothing would make me happier than him having a Cy Young season. Like yeah, and I'm course. not. You know, same thing with you. We're not. We're not saying that we think these guys are bad. But yeah, Mitch Haniger, there is definitely a risk. He has not been. You know, I don't expect 2021 Mitch Haniger, but, you know, 2022 Haniger would be a, a nice boost and you're going to mm. need a lot for that to go right. So that that is absolutely a fair, fair person to, to mention there. So you won't get anything from me on that. <laughs> I, I think that is absolutely fair. Yeah. <laughs> so just be nice in the comments about that. I'm sorry. I love Mitch and I am, <laughs> I, you know, like I said, I hope that he has, you know, a 130 uh, WRC plus season. That would be insane. But you know, I'll, I'll honestly just be happy if he's league average. That's really, um, I, I feel like it's all we need because I feel like a lot of the issues last year was just the fact we had so many guys that were under league average, uh, you know? And so if yep. you just take most of those players and make them league average last year, so not, you know, star players, just league average, I think we could have uh, probably even won the division potentially. Um, so we'll get into the viewer questions. I, I don't want to waste too much of your time. So we'll, we'll try to get through these somewhat quick here. Uh, the first one we have is from Judah Westcott. Thank you for putting it on Twitter. Which minor leaguer do you think is going to make big, big plays for us this year? Oh, good question. And you are not wasting my time at all. I could talk Mariners for 10 hours if I didn't have to work my day job. So yeah, no. <laughs> um, I, I think the most obvious, um, you know, Ryan Bliss, I think Tyler Locklear and Emerson Hancock. I still consider Emerson Hancock a minor leaguer. Um, you know, if Wu and Miller, maybe listen, first and foremost, injuries happen. You know, we lost Robbie Ray after 30 pitches last year. So you could see an Emerson Hancock come up very quickly if something were to happen to a starter and make an impact. Um, I think Ryan Bliss is kind of the wild card, you know, is if we don't get that bounce back from Urias, if Rojas struggles a little bit, maybe even Ty France, you know, and you have to move someone over to first base if we don't get that tie bounce back. Uh, Ryan Bliss is someone that could possibly, I think, come up. And even Tyler Locklear, I would say those are the two that could be the most, you know, not just filling in, but actually could add a boost to this team um in 2024 yeah i'm gonna go with ryan bliss too um i think especially if we don't get that uh 
you know, everyday third baseman or second baseman uh, with the last 29 days that we have. Um, I, I can see Bliss being uh, good for potentially a platoon on one of those positions, probably second base, I guess, because I think that's where he's pretty much slotted in at. So I could definitely see him getting up here uh, this year. I, I would probably almost guarantee it at some point he's he's gonna make an appearance um so that that's who i would say just based off of pure probability that um he's gonna make it onto the major league roster at some point this year so i'll, I'll go with him on that one um so second one we're gonna go into from kyle can you build an all-time mariners bullpen now this i'm gonna have to go a lot more for you because as i said earlier i've only been a fan for a couple of years so i only know of a few names <laughs> other than the the current bullpen so i guess this will be more your question than mine yeah so you know you'd mentioned only being a fan for a couple of years certainly some good options with paul seawald andres munoz matt brash um you know maybe not quite the longevity yet to be in there um, one of the best closer seasons I ever watched as a fan, uh, was 2006 and 2007. JJ puts was absolutely lights out. Uh, there used to be kind of a meme back then it was puts in game over. Like it was just, he came in and there was no doubt the game was going to be over. Um, 2012, I think it was Tom Wilhelmson was really good. Um, going further back. It's funny. The Mariners actually had some really bad bullpens in the nineties. It was one of the things that hurt the team. Um, during the A Rod Griffey and and those guys with some of the uh, really really poor bullpens, but um, you know it's uh, it then came out of that. Cass Sasaki in the early two thousands would be up there. Um, so I think you go Sasaki. I think puts two thousand six two thousand seven. Um, I'm putting Munoz and Brash just because their stuff is so electric. I'm putting Seawald in there because the leadership. And I feel like we need a lefty in there as well. And I'm trying to think of some really probably missing somebody too, you know, that's like right there. That was an obvious one. Um, I heard Edwin Diaz was going good back for us before he went to the Mets. Right? Oh gosh. And of course, Edwin Diaz, you know, and, and you know, if I'm off camera, I can think of all these names, but yeah. as soon as the camera comes on, you know, you get, you get camera shy and you forget. Yeah. Edwin Diaz, of course he was lights out. Um, you know, before they kind of did the little mini fire sale that they did. Um, he came up in 2016. He was lights out. Uh, I'm trying to think. I, I can't go too far back be, behind 95. I don't know if there was someone in the 80s that was really good um, that I wouldn't know about. I'm trying to think of some other good ones. Um, trying to think of like a really good lefty they had. Charlie Furbush was a lefty they had in the bullpen like 2012 to... 2016 he was a solid lefty reliever um I'm trying to think fernando rodney was pretty good in 2014 i don't think i'd put him in the all-time yeah. mariners bullpen though I, I think we've got most of them I, i'm pr i could be missing somebody that was really really obvious um and if i am i apologize arthur rhodes you know what i'll say arthur rhodes for the lefty arthur rhodes is really good uh, in the early 2000s. So you got Rhodes as your lefty, Diaz, Seawald, Munoz, Brash, Putz. Um, I, th I think I threw somebody else in there that I've cast for, Sasaki. For I think that, yeah, for but I'd, I'd probably go Arthur Rhodes, but maybe a couple lefties, you know, um, isn't a bad thing. I think that's a pretty good bullpen. That would be a hard one to beat. And if I'm missing somebody, I do apologize. Yeah, and I, and I, I like I said, I don't really have much of an answer for this, so I guess I would have, I knew of Tom Wilhelmson, so I'll go with that, I'll go with Diaz, I'll go with uh, Brash. And the next question is from Mariner Steve, we already went over this, favorite Mariner of all time for you, it sounds like it's Edgar, <laughs> right? I, I'd have to say Edgar, uh, Mariner Steve's a great Twitter fall, by the way, if everyone's yep. not following him. Um You know, Edgar, for as a youth, as I got older, Felix Hernandez just because and it's going to sound cheesy, but so many bad Mariners teams from 2005 to 2000 and what was Felix's last year, 19. There were some good years, uh, 7, 14, 16. They, they were pretty decent teams. But I mean, there were some days where it was hard to watch this team. They were just outmanned, outmatched. And when Felix pitched, it didn't matter who they were playing. You felt like they were could compete. 
You could go into Yankee Stadium with Felix Hernandez on the mound, and you felt like that Mariners team was as good as the Yankees, at least on that night. And it made some tough seasons. And, and you know, you always, you know, anytime Felix pitched, you never knew what could happen. You could see a perfect game, no hit or something special. So I think as I got older, it was Felix just because it got through, he, you know, Felix helped get me through some tough summers, um, each row as well. But growing up, Edgar's probably my all time favorite Mariner. Yeah. And uh, I would say for me, I've always been a Ken Griffey guy. There's just, uh, for me, it's the swing. Uh, there, there is no prettier swing yeah. in baseball history <laughs> than Ken Griffey. So oh. um, yeah. And he's the only uh, Mariners Jersey I have right now. So and, and there's a reason why I, I I've always been kind of just a Griffey guy, even when I wasn't a Mariners fan. So I'll have to go with him. Very obvious, like cop out answer, but <laughs> that's, I don't really have anyone. No, deeper. Um, I would say on the current I, roster, everybody like, had them. Go ahead. I was gonna say when we were kids, you know, everybody did the Griffey swing, you know, yeah. that was even people that didn't know baseball, you know, knew Ken Griffey jr. He was truly, you know, a trans, you know, just, more bigger than baseball essentially mm -hmm. type players. So that, that, that is, that's a great pick. I mean, everybody, you know, kids knew Griffey and it puts, he put Seattle baseball on the map. He was one of the reasons. Yeah. I would say if I were to pick anyone from uh, this current team, I would say Logan Gilbert. I don't know why, just there's something about him. He's so calm, cool and collected. And uh, I, I thankfully was able to watch him pitch uh, in August last year. And um it's just, yeah, I just, I, I respect my, uh, tall, lanky pitchers. <laughs> and so I'm a tall guy myself. So, you know, I feel, uh, I feel like I'm, you know, he's, he's representing all the tall guys out there because he's gotta be what, like six, five or something. He's absolutely huge. I don't know yeah. I think he is six, four, six, five. And, and I love Logan too, because you know, I, not that he's forgotten by anybody, but you know, Castillo and Kirby, I think get a little bit more publicity. Mm -hmm. I'll put Logan up against anybody, you know, with, with a playoff game on the line, Logan, you know, um, against Texas in that last series of the year was phenomenal. So yeah. I, I actually, I like that. I think Cal's my current favorite, but I, I love Logan Gilbert. He gets, I think kind of forgotten in the pile of Mariners pitchers a little bit, but he is so underrated. Yeah. And so I, and that's the other reason I like him too, is he's just, it feels like he's never in the conversation like he should be. Um, so uh, I'll go with him. And then I, I just looked it up. He's six, six actually. So he is really tall. <laughs> so wow. a lot, a lot taller than I thought. Uh, so to get into the last question, this is from Mariner Mojo, uh, who has the best beard of all the Mariners content creators. I had to put this in there. Um, I personally think it's probably you. I feel like, uh, you know, people might say me, but I feel like yours is a lot more fuller and, and than a mine and just a lot more of like the classic beard look. Whereas I feel like mine's kind of, I don't like how it's like all out, you know, it, I don't know how to, to get that to change. So do you, how do you feel? Do I, Cause I know like Colton has one too. So, um, yeah. Yeah, he does. Um, lo love Mojo, love Mariner Mojo, probably, um, you know, one of my favorite Mariners channels by far. Um, my beard actually grows out, out the same way. I just have to use a lot of stuff in it and mm. get it trimmed up very specifically to get it more in that, I guess, V shape, you would call it. Um, yeah. cause mine will grow out too. In fact, if you go look at some of my videos, you can tell what I'm due for a beard trim. Cause it does start to get very, it grows out more than it does um, down. So favorite beard. You know what? I'm going to give it to you. I, I like yours. I, I like you've got the mustache that <laughs> I wish because mine just kind of goes into my beard and yours has that yeah. very symmetrical um, yeah, look to it. So it, yeah. it, it, it flows a lot better. So mine just kind of all goes into one big pile of hair, so, <laughs> but there are some great beards in the, uh, in the Mariners YouTube community for sure. So I'll give you the nod on it. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. So I guess our, our answers are just vice versa. I pick you, you pick me and, there you know, we each there get we go. a vote. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, so I think that's going to be, uh, ultimately it for this episode of the, you love to see a podcast. Uh, Appreciate Jay for taking the time on any last words you have to say for the people out there. Yeah, no, just thank you for having me on. Um, obviously, you know, this is on your channel, but you know, for any of my subs, you know, get, give Jake a sub. Um, hopefully maybe we can do some collabs during the season as well. That would be a lot of fun. Last thing 
thing is to this fan base is that I, I know, listen, I don't think any of us like this ownership group. I think it's the one thing all Mariners fans can unite on. Whether you like Jerry, Justin, Scott, I think it's up for personal opinion. I will say this to Mariners fans, though. I do think the core of this team is really good. This is one of the best staffs in baseball. You have Julio Rodriguez, Cal Raleigh. We, we even mentioned J.P. Crawford in this video, how good he is up the middle. This team can compete. I do believe it. And I try to separate, like, yes, I hate this ownership group. Like you said, I wish they would just open the wallets for things instead of doing all this nickel and dime stuff. But this is a good baseball team. I do think they can win. And I think it can be a really fun season. And I certainly hope it is. So I hope fans are excited for the 2024 season. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And you put it a lot better than I can uh, since I, I don't have the talking skills that you do. So I'm not going to try, but I feel the exact same way. Um, so yeah, that, that'll do it for this episode. Once again, you can find all uh, episodes of this pod available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. Uh, do what you normally would do. You can like and subscribe on the YouTube channel. You can uh, rate it five stars and follow it on any streaming platforms. Uh, so once again, thank you for Jay for coming on the episode. And I guess we will see you next time. See ya. That'll be good. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Thank you.